Jana Salaka Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Saitanya Mao Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padati Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Bhacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Astyatya De Sutarine Vanchakalpa Taru Vesja Kripa Sindhu Veva Chapatitanam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadhar, Sri Vasadi, Gaur, Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <clears throat> Especially after we finish a major festival in our society, I always think it's <clears throat> the appropriate time to once again review the importance of chanting the holy names of the Lord. <clears throat> this is both a reminder of the position of the holy name within our practice of Krishna consciousness, <clears throat> but it's also re uh, a reminder to understand the glories of the holy name, the power of the holy name, the all-pervading uh, and the all-pervading cure for everything in existence, the, the holy name of the Lord. <clears throat> so I chose one verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is from the second canto, first chapter. And uh, verse number 11, the, the chapter is called The Cosmic Manifestation. Etam nirvidyamananam Itchitam akutabayam yoginam nirpa nirnitam harir nama nu kirtanam. O king, constantly chanting of the holy name of the Lord after the ways of the great authorities is the doubtless and fearless way of success for all, including those who are free from all material desires, those who are desirous of all material enjoyment and also those who are self-satisfied by dint of transcendental knowledge. Uh, this is a very, very long purport, so I won't be going into the whole thing. But we'll read a little bit. In the previous verse, the great necessity for attaining attachment to Mukunda has been accredited. There are different types of persons who desire to attain success in different varieties of pursuits. Generally, the persons are materialists who desire to enjoy the fullest extent of material gratification. Next to them are the transcendentalists who have attained perfect knowledge about the nature of material enjoyment and thus are aloof from such an illusory way of life. More or less, they are satisfied in themselves by self-realization. Above them are the devotees of the Lord who neither aspire for, to enjoy the material world nor desire to get out of it. They are after the satisfaction of the Lord, Sri Krishna. <clears throat> in other words, the devotees of the Lord do not want anything on their personal account. If the Lord desires, the devotees can accept all types sorts of material facilities and if the lord does not desire this the devotee can leave aside all sorts of facilities even up to the limit of salvation <clears throat> nor are they self-satisfied because they want the satisfaction of the lord only <clears throat> in this verse sri sukadev goswami recommends the chanting the transcendental chanting of the holy name of the lord by offenseless chanting and hearing of the holy name of the Lord, one becomes acquainted with the transcendental form of the Lord, and then with the attributes of the Lord, and then with the transcendental nature of his pastimes, etc. 
here it is mentioned that one should constantly chant the holy name of the Lord after hearing it from the authorities. <clears throat> this means that hearing from the authorities is the first essential <clears throat> hearing of the holy name gradually promotes one to the stage of hearing about his form, his att attributes, his pastimes, and so on. And thus the necessity of chanting of his glories develops successfully. This process is recommended not only for the successful execution of devotional service, but also even for those who are materially attached. According to Sri Sukadeva Goswami, the, attain, the way of attaining success is an established fact, concluded not only by, by him, but also by the previous acharyas. Therefore, there is no need for further evidence the process is recommended not only for the progressive students in different departments of ideological success, but also for those who are already successful in their achievements of food workers as philosophers or as devotees of the Lord. And then in the rest of the purport, we go into the different offenses of the holy names of the Lord, but we'll stop here. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. The verse is very ex exclusively sweeping. It sweeps everything in one to one particular point that the chanting of the holy names of the Lord is the doubtless and fearless way of success for all. <clears throat> so, this has been proven by great authorities, such as in this case. Subdev Goswami, Srila uh, Haridas Thakur, Srila uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and a whole long list of the previous acharyas who have made the holy name of their Lord their sadhana. <laughs> there is sadhana, and there is sadhya. There is, and of course, there is seva. Actually, sadhya, sadhana, seva, and sadhya. Sadhana means the hearing and chanting of the glories of the Lord. Seva means to execute practical activities in devotional service. And sadhya means to get the result or the goal of those two combined together, the sadhya and the Seva. Now here we're talking about sadhana becoming sadhya. <laughs> that means the purpose of chanting or the process of chanting comes to the point of what? <clears throat> when Srila Prabhupada was asked in New York City uh, by a reporter, he, he said, Swamiji, what do you get from this chanting? And Prabhupada said, we get chanting from chanting. Mm. That was Prabhupada's firm and very uh, succinct response to that particular question, which is the essence of the answer. <clears throat> that actually we chant in order to chant. Chanting in the offensive stage becomes difficult and hard to continue because of the offenses. That is called namaparad, or chanting on that level of existence. And then, of course, in the second half of the purport, we get a listing of the 10 offenses, along with the mention of the 11th offense also. And therefore, we get an understanding of where to the essence. Of course, there are more offenses that one should avoid, but these are the foundation for the chanting offenses, which was read by Srila Prabhupada during every initiation ceremony. And in some of those initiation ceremonies conducted by his divine grace, he explained each one of those 
10 offenses one by one, making it clear that there are two aspects to the process of devotional service. They're called vidis, things to do, nishedas, things to avoid. So we know <clears throat> the things to do, and it's important also, essential in order to get the benefit of what we do, we have to avoid certain uh, mentalities which lead to wrong activities, which lead to either offenses or material considerations. And these are the 10 offenses, like, but there are more, there are much more than that. <clears throat> so this chanting process must go on in every situation. Chanting means to honor Krishna in the form of a great personality. The process of chanting is to welcome in a very, uh, what we say, respectful way, the presence of the Lord in his name. This morning I was listening to Srila Prabhupada describe in very detail how the Lord's name and his and himself are non-different. Although he appears in sound, the absolute principle of spiritual negates anything other than the principle being emphasized. In other words, Krishna's name is Krishna. Now, that may be hard, not hard, but maybe say inconceivable for us to fully understand. We get a little understanding based on the principle of the essence of spirituality. The essence of spirituality is it is the opposite of material in the sense that in material, everything is relative. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made that statement very clear. And one is mentioned also in the Chaitanya Charitamrita where he said, some people say this is good and some people say this is bad. He said, I say, this is all mental speculation. So good and bad in this world is relative. What may be good under one circumstance or according to one's opinion, may be bad by another circumstance or another person's opinion. We see that constantly in our life. You know, I give you an example just to deviate a little slightly. This was a personal example. Um, many years ago, I'm, I'm sure I remember the year was in the winter of 2006. I was in Denver, Colorado. I hadn't gotten there and they were during the Christmas festival. And I was scheduled to leave right after Christmas, be, just before the new year. So while I was there, there was a huge snowstorm and it, it blanketed practically the whole Midwest and uh, nothing could move. Uh, trains, buses, planes, all transportation was stopped. Schools were closed, businesses were closed. Everything was at a standstill. It was a major, major. And so the news was, you know, so much money is being lost because of lack of commerce. So many thousands and thousands of people cannot go to where they want to go because all transportation is shut down. But so from that perspective, it appeared to be bad or undesirable. Now, from another perspective, other people who are living in that area, they were owners of ski slopes. And, then, and in Colorado, skiing is a very big sport. It goes on quite enthusiastically, especially during the winter season. And there are, it's a very lucrative business during that time because there are so many, many mountains in Colorado. So the ski slopes were wide open, the best situation for coming and skiing. 
And so people, you were using their time going to ski slopes. People who were owning the ski slopes were making much more money than they had done for the whole year, just in a few weeks, as people were taking advantage of this snowstorm. So here, that's an example of how, from one perspective, it looks bad, and from another perspective, it looks good. And that's how the material world is un understood and estimated. So in this world, which illustrates Lord Chaitanya's statement, nothing is good and nothing is bad <laughs> because it's all relative to a situation or to someone's opinion. But in the absolute sense, in the spiritual sense, everything is good. There is no bad <clears throat> because everything is absolute. There is no opposite in spirituality. Spirituality is self-contained. It has only one aspect to, it is beneficial and it's always expanding. Both principles are there. It, <clears throat> it helps to awaken one's consciousness in, a, in towards Krishna. And at the same time, it expands one's awareness of Krishna that is spiritual. So this is where the holy name is the foundation for achieving both of those things. And therefore it's absolute and it's Krishna himself. Uh, there's no relative. It's not like uh, the Acharyas give some uh, uh, understanding how people see the holy name. For the materialist, they may see it and most of them will see it as simply five letters. K-R-S-N-A. And they think, well, these are just letters of the alphabet. You put them together and you create a name. So how is that name God? <laughs> how can God be so, uh, when we say, simplified that by putting five letters together and speaking it, you're associating with God? <laughs> so they think it's simply a name or maybe a good name but it's a name, that's all. Now, higher than that are there are devotees who think that the name represents the Lord. In other words, they think, well, Krishna's name represents Krishna. Just like an ambassador may represent the king, but he is not the king, he's simply the representative. He may have many of the powers of the king deputed to him, but still, he is who he is in the same way. And therefore devotees see in a relative way that the holy name that it is representing Krishna. Now, higher than that, and ultimately the only understanding or correct understanding is that Krishna's name is Krishna. There's no difference. Krishna's form is Krishna. Krishna's attributes his qualities are him, and his pastimes are also non-different. This, this is the absolute nature of spirit, as opposed to the relative uh, understanding of how things are, are judged in this material world. So when you're chanting Krishna's name, you are actually, actually inviting Krishna in the form of his name to come and appear in your life, in your mind, in your heart. Just like when you call someone, by calling them, you're hoping that they will respond to your call, to come to you, to be with you, to talk to you. In some way, you are making a welcome exclamation. So when we're chanting the holy names, we're actually calling Krishna to please come and be a part of my life. In other words, please come. And what does Prabhupada say when we're asking Krishna to come through the chanting of the holy names? Prabhupada makes a statement, there is only one explanation in terms of interpretation of what is chanting, and that is we are asking Krishna for service. My dear Lord, how can I serve you? This was this was enunciated by Srila Bhaktivedanta Thakur in many of his writings that 
the chanting of the holy name is to welcome Krishna into our life so we can actually engage in his service. Mm -hmm. And of course, bringing Krishna into your life, into your mind, into your heart means just like when you bring water into a dirty place, you're beginning the process of cleaning. And if you apply the water in the right way and then you remove the dirt accordingly, then the place that was once unfit for habitation becomes a place that you want to be in. So in the same way, living within ourselves with whatever material contaminations is not a very happy experience. <laughs> material life simply tortures one's mind, heart, body with so many desires that don't lead that don't lead to any form of happiness or satisfaction. They simply cause us to act and react in a certain way in order to get a particular result, the result which we feel will satisfy us at least temporarily. And that's the best we can do. But that temporarily means that it'll be gone in due course of time. But bringing Krishna into your life means that now those material desires, or we call it material contamination, contamination is the right thing because the soul is by nature pure. And everything connected to the soul in, an, in, in a way of the association with material energy is a form of dirt or contamination. So this chanting is like sweeping the room, washing the floor, getting rid of the dirt, looking behind the furniture and moving it out and sweeping the dirt behind there. There's two kinds of people who clean. We can see this in, in our day-to-day -day life. There's people who clean a room by what they can see. And there's those who actually clean the room. <laughs> they move, they get behind the furniture, they get underneath, they go along the tops of the ledges. They, they, they know dirt could be anywhere and everywhere it is. So those cleaners are the most effective and the most thorough. So in the same way, the chanting of the holy name cleanses not only the external dirt in the form of material desires in terms of the gross forms of material desires, which we mention in the four regulative principles, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meeting and gamble, gambling. But then again, each one of the gross material desires have a physical, not a physical, I'm sorry, subtle counterpart to them, which is hard to see, but which is the motivation force behind our gross desires, the subtle. So the holy name sweeps away all of the material desires on the gross level. And then as we continue, it starts to purify those corners where you can't see those dirts and they start coming out in the form of seeing what is our material contamination, how, how, whether we're envious, uh, lusty, uh, duplicious, or anything that is of the nature of uh, fearful. All of these are the subtle forms of material desires. Um, so this is the power of the holy name. So when we're, when we're chanting, we're welcoming a great personality into our life who can purify our life and who we can actually get to know. <laughs> and chanting means to get to know Krishna. Because there is, as is mentioned here in this purport, there is a succession in the chanting process. From the name comes the form, from the form comes the qualities, from the qualities comes the pastimes. Yeah, it's a little bit higher up. If you go higher up, you'll find that in towards the beginning. Yeah, yeah the, the, the glories develop successfully. Here it says by offenseless standing here, one becomes, no, up here. Yeah, here, right there. 
Yeah, but yeah, starting there. Keep going down all the way to the word successfully. Successively, yeah, this is right here. <laughs> yeah, now this is the process here. One becomes acquainted with the transcendental form of love. What does acquainted mean? Again, it means gets to know that the form of the Lord is also transcendental. In other words, when we see the Lord's form in his deity form, we actually feel or understand both. We get a feeling for and an understanding of Krishna who has appeared in that form. In other words, we actually become ecstatic and happy. We get realization that Krishna's form is Krishna. And the next is his attributes, his characteristics. And then the last is his pastime. So this is successful four-step process, how the holy name takes one through different stages of realization on the absolute truth. The pastimes are considered to be the culmination of perfection, where we hear that great personalities such as Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Jiva Goswami, Gopal Bhatta Goswami, uh, um, what else? who else? Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, many, Bilba Mangler Thakur, and many other great personalities. They explain, they can actually describe the pastimes of the Lord. Why? Because they are within those pastimes. They are seeing the pastimes. They're actually taking part in Krishna's pastimes both as an observer and as a participant. This is the power of the holy name. Otherwise, how could they write about the Lord's glories and pastimes? It's not simply some philosophical conjecture about what we think sounds very spiritual. What it is, is it's a realization of the experiencing they're having participating in the pastimes of Krishna. We have the example of Srila Rupa Goswami. Srila Rupa Goswami, one time when he was writing his pastimes, he went into a meditation. And in that meditation, he saw these two girls, girls, little girls of Vrindavan. And as he was watching them, one of the girls had a long braid that came all the way down her back. And that was it. And then, but he, when he saw it, he was thinking this braid is a snake. And so he started to call out to the girls, be careful, there's a snake, there's a black snake. The girls turned around, laughed, and then disappeared. It was actually Radharani and Lalita and Jurupa Goswami was seeing what he thought was a snake crawling up Radharani's backside, but actually it was her, her hair braid. So when he realized what had happened, then he was a little bit ashamed that he had m misunderstood what had ac actually was going on. And at the same time, he had realization of Radharani's glories. So this is, um, this is an example of how the uh, great souls not only write about, but are taking part in Krishna's pastimes as they write. <laughs> it's almost like a television in some sense. It's an experience. It's not just some uh, philosophy that they're putting on paper. It's much more than that. So this is the holy name. And as Srila Prabhupada said many times, the, whole, the chanting of the holy name, and he uses an interesting word, he says, panacea. Panacea. Um, I think, let's go to the definition of panacea. Who can, uh, can you find the definition of panacea? I think it means cure. Panacea. P-A-N-A-C-E-A. C-E-A. 
Yeah, definition. A solution or remedy for all difficulties or diseases. Yeah, a solution or remedy for all difficulties or diseases. And Prabhupada, you said the, pan, the holy name is a panacea for all ills. So that includes difficulties and diseases also. And I think I should mention one thing. Um, I received a letter not too long ago, maybe a couple months ago, from one uh, inmate. In fact, there was another uh, devotee who was preaching to this inmate, received this letter and they sent it to me. It was about one inmate, and this happened back in December of last year. He was in jail and he uh, apparently came down with coronavirus. And so he was quite sick. Now being in jail, uh, many of us who know what goes on in jails in terms of taking care of inmates know that they don't get the care that they should get or could get. So he was pretty much, not pretty much, he was completely neglected. No medical treatment was given to him. In other words, he was left to die. <clears throat> So he went, he had some connection with devotees through letters. He heard about chanting the holy name. He thought, let me just chant. And he did. And in a very concentrated and a somewhat desperate way, he was chanting the holy names without any association, without any remedies, without any treatments, nothing. After a couple of weeks, he was completely cured of coronavirus. There was no trace of any illness left. So of course, we don't <clears throat> say that that's all you should do. <laughs> because may, we may not have the same faith as that inmate had. And he had a lot of faith. I mean, he was desperate, obviously. Not only was he chanting, but he was also calling out to Krishna to save him, Con constantly calling and chanting to the Lord. And he, his intensity in his activities of chanting and calling reached perfection. He, he was absorbed in calling and chanting. And he reached the stage that everything was gone. And Prabhupada actually writes that. <laughs> he said, you know, that's Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He said, I've come in this stage of Kali with the medicine. I have the medicine for everything. And that is chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Of course, we're not interested in trying to use the Holy Hare Krishna Maha Mantra for some material cure, such as diseases, but it does work also. <laughs> it does work also. We use it for, as, as we mentioned earlier, as a way to serve the Lord. We call, we chant the holy name, so Krishna comes into the, our life and reveals to us our service to him and how we can offer that service to him in devotion. But, and this is a very important part to, to understand, within the spiritual, the material exists all of, also. So material problems our problems only when we use material solutions to tackle them. If you simply practice Krishna consciousness properly, without trying to solve your material problems, they go away anyway. <laughs> because material problems are a shadow over the cover of the living entities existing, and they have no real substance. So they disappear in higher consciousness in higher consciousness, which we receive see from chanting, hearing, and chat. Our material problems go. But that's not the goal. The goal is to develop our love of God, prema pumarta maha. Not even liberation is the goal of chanting. <clears throat> liberation is a byproduct of chanting. And one, when one chants, with, as Prabhupada says, when one chants without offense, one is on the liberated platform. And then the next stage is to come to the platform of love of God 
And that take, then we continue to chant in that mood. Like that. So this verse is very important. I would uh, encourage the devotees to continue to read these offense, <coughs> offenses <coughs> and also understand each particular offense. So we'll stop here and see if we can find some time for discussion. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for the wonderful and power packed class about chanting of the holy name and uh, glories of the holy name and uh, about uh, uh, like you give nice examples, nice stories, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for reminding us again and again about this importance of the holy name chanting. Thank you so much. I request devotees if they have any questions or uh, comments or realizations, uh, please they can unmute themselves and ask Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. Maharaj, thank you very much for a wonderful class uh, and a regular reminder on the glories of the holy name. So thank you very much, Maharaj. Maharaj, I have one question, two questions. For the first one is, I really like your example. I have not heard this before. Uh, comparing the chanting of the holy names to the furniture, cleaning the furniture and the dust around the furniture. It was very nice uh, and very, very uh, strong. Uh, Maharaj, you said that, uh, you, you mentioned that the dust which are around the corners that we don't see, the subtle unearthers, that also gets sweeped up and that also then comes out. Um, for cleansing, in what form, how does it, the subtle, like envy and greed, lust, how do they come out? Um, external manifestations we, we of. Yeah, they, appear, they appear by the chanting of the holy name, and then we, we recognize them and then we let them go. In other words, we become aware that they're now being uprooted. <coughs> Uh, the example would be, <coughs> the example is when you make ghee. So you put the butter on the fire on a very, very slow flame. Uh, if you put it on a fast flame, you can't do it. If you put it on too slow of a flame, it may take forever. You have to find that flame that is appropriate for making the ghee. <laughs> And what happens gradually, gradually, the fatty part, which is considered the parts you want to remove, are considered to be impurities. So where do they go? They stay, some stay at the bottom and some come to the top. Most come to the top. And then you take your spoon that has slots in it and you scoop it out. And you put it, and you use those things, and we call them impurities of the ghee, which is just the fatty part of the ghee, the butter, fatty part of the butter. And they can be kept, but you really are looking for the ghee, which is the purity. So, in the same way, <clears throat> our material desires in the subtle forms, along with the gross forms, are also rising to the top of our, in other words, they're coming to awareness. We're starting to see by experience what is the nature of our contaminations. And the thing is that you don't want to analyze them or somehow or other try to understand them in different ways. You just let them go. As you know, the same way when, uh, when you're uh, just like in Ayurveda, I'll give you an example. Ayurveda is the perfect example is that when you're taking the treatment of Ayurveda, sometimes you feel like you're getting worse. <laughs> but what happens, what is happening is the purities or impurities are starting to settle in one area. Just like, it's called ama. Ama means the impurities, A-M-A. <clears throat> and 
And these are in different places within the body. So through the treatment of Ayurveda, they push these impurities into the stomach area. And then you take a, they call it verachin, and you take some kind of medicine, and then it pushes all those impurities out. And then they're gone. But first to gather them up in one place, so while the impurities are being gathered, you're going through a little bit more difficulty until they actually are removed from the body. So in the same way, the holy name is bringing them out. And then at one point, they come to the surface of our consciousness gradually, and then we let them go. We remove them. We purge them out simply by recognizing them, avoiding them, and don't try to analyze them to see what they're like because the analysis will force them to go back down into the, into the subtle consciousness again. Just let them go. <clears throat> it's like <clears throat> you have some, <clears throat> sometimes we watch our thoughts and we see certain thoughts going through our mind and we pick those thoughts what we like and we stop there. So as these, impurities are coming to the mental level, we just watch them go and not stop there and try to understand more about them because then you refeed them. Mm -hmm. Anything you think about, you re, you've, you're starting to again become affected by that. You let it go. You, you dismiss it. You don't give it any attention. <laughs> but initially we recognize it. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, yes, I mean, yes. So we acknowledge that if, you, if there's a feeling of envy, for example, you acknowledge and then you, you let it go. Don't, don't mull on it, yeah. don't think too much of that. If it comes, yeah. okay. Yeah, and they're going, <laughs> let them go. <laughs> But you recognize, oh, this is the way I am. This is the way I'm feeling. And you let it go. Mm -hmm. I don't want it. Mm -hmm. It's like holding on to the shadow. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Thank you. This is, this is so nice. Thanks. Does, Thank you. Does it make sense? <laughs> yes, yes, Maharaj. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what the holy name will do. But as you said, it might get bad before it gets better. <laughs> the turning of the milk ocean in the eighth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam illustrates the process of purification. Are you aware of that pastime? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and what came out first? Poison, halal. Hala. Poison. And before they could get to the nectar, the poison came out. Lord Shiva was there to save the world. And then the nectar came and everyone wanted it. But the poison was first. That's how the process of purification uh, proceeds. <laughs> Getting rid of what we what we don't need or what we don't desire, what we don't want. <clears throat> Thank you, That's why some devotees, when it, some devotees will say, boy, I used to be a nice person until I became a Hare Krishna. Look what <laughs> happened to me. Now I'm a mess. <laughs> it's because you didn't recognize all your contaminations. Now they're coming out. They're coming to the surface. Now you're thinking, oh my God. <laughs> this is what I had hidden in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, 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 that's what happens. Some devotees, when they get initiated, they start to see certain things they don't like. <laughs> they think, what is this initiation? It's pushing me backwards. <laughs> but actually, it's, it's bringing you to a higher state of consciousness slowly by removing. Thank you. This, is, this makes so much sense and it's practical. Yeah, there's many experiences. <clears throat> Thank you. 
You had another question? <laughs> uh, no, this was answered in this one, in the discussion. So, okay. thank you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, Mansi Mataji, you want to ask? You can unmute. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. Um, this is a surprise for me because I have been contemplating so much on certain impurities that I can see in myself. For past few days, I have been contemplating and uh, today's lecture has been a nectar, has been a lot of clarifications has come out of this. Um, but I still have one doubt that when, I, when we see, when I see a lot of selfishness in me, when being grahastas, you have to make a lot of decisions. And when you see that selfishness, I was wondering that are the living entities eternally selfish? I mean, or do they or it gets purified? Uh, in the material world, selfishness is the principle of existence, but it, it takes the form of self-centeredness. We center ourselves on ourselves rather than sending ourselves sending ourself on Krishna. So just moving the center away from ourself and onto Krishna breaks through that selfishness or self-centeredness. We have desires and we're trying to fulfill those desires and that is called selfishness or self-centeredness. When we try to fulfill the desires of Krishna through the process of devotional service because we are connected with Krishna we actually become purified or we become free from this selfishness or self-centeredness. Then we develop more the mood of selflessness or acting for the benefit of others, which is a characteristic of sending ourselves on Krishna. So one who's, one who's Krishna conscious or applying the principles of, of the practice of Krishna consciousness, is kind and well-wishing for everyone. Srila Prabhupada used to sign his letters, your ever well-wisher. He was always acting for the benefit of others because he was fully situated in Krishna. So as we uh, focus on Krishna and devotional service, then we develop more of a selflessness towards ourself. Sometimes we're selfish towards ourself. We don't like ourselves for some reason, whatever reason that is. That's called self-envy. What is self-envy? Is that my principle of existence is, you know, that I am a servant, but I don't wanna be a servant. I wanna be an enjoyer. I wanna be served. That's called self-envy. I don't like who I am. I am a servant, but I want to be an enjoyer. So I have this uh, unhappiness towards myself. And then, uh, then uh, that springs out towards other people. And then ultimately God himself. So when we center our, our activities around Krishna for the pleasure of Krishna, and the pleasure of Krishna's devotees, we develop this selflessness and then we also become free from this self-centeredness simultaneously because everything in relationship to Krishna is in the mood of selflessness or focusing on the real self not the body and this is where we get into the right definition we are not this body we have a body and we have a mind. Therefore, all your so-called uh, contaminations or negativities are simply the coverings over your pure self, which is a, a soul, pure soul. Jivya, Sarup, Naya, Krishna, Krishna, and Nichidas, all living entities are Krishna's part and parcel. 
and they all have all wonderful qualities. They have Krishna's qualities in smaller quantities, in a smaller quantity also. But the, the, the soul has all good qualities. So we're simply identif identifying with the coverings, which are the material energy that's covering over the soul, that's all. So selflessness is in the mode of goodness. And that brings you to transcendental. Selflessness means to act for the benefit of Krishna, to act for the benefit of others. So Maharaj, um... I can tell you that we, th we think, we think that by doing that, I will not satisfy my own desires. This is the problem. I think if I act for the benefit of others, I, what will I get out of it? So we don't see that the principle of acting for the benefit of others is our own self benefit. <laughs> because the nature of this, the, the nature, and I say nature, the intrinsic quality of the soul is to serve. So when we're in a mood of service, we're happy. We're happy. When we're serving, we're happy. And we're serving in the right way, and we're really happy. Yes. Yeah. So, Maharaj, um, so through the process of Krishna consciousness, we'll take the journey from being self centered or selfish to the level of um, Krishna centered. Correct? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. So we, I mean, I shouldn't get so worried seeing that selfishness in me, as you said earlier, that it shouldn't be paid much, much attention. It's purification and let it just go. I just act the opposite way. Act, act selflessly for... In other words, act in devotional service. Yes, but Krishna, acting... You have to understand, Krishna doesn't need anything we do. He doesn't need our service. But he places him in a, himself in a position of being the recipient of our service. And he explains to us how we should serve and in what mood we should serve. And it's all about our benefit. It's not for him. He doesn't need it. He's, he's Atmaram, he's self-satisfied in himself. He requires nothing outside of himself. So what he gets from us is the opportunity to reciprocate what we give to him back to us in the form of the benefit we get from serving him. <laughs> so we're benefiting when we serve him. <laughs> But then, Maharaj, that is in relation to when we are being selfish in terms of devotional service or in our dealings with the devotees. But when we are dealing with non-devotees and then we make certain decisions to protect our bhakti life or our devotional life, you know, we are... That's different. That's completely different. Yeah. That you have to... That's part of... That's part of your devotional progress. As we mentioned, there are vidis, things to do, nishedas, things to avoid. So in relationship to the material energy, you definitely have to avoid certain activities and a certain mindset, which will feed your consciousness into the same energy you're trying to get out. In other words, if you're acting materially in relationship to the materialist, you're going to become like them. Yes. And certainly, Maharaj, um, sometimes I feel that what type of progress that I have made that, you know, at each and every minute, I try to avoid the association of people who will take me away from Krishna consciousness. But then sometimes I feel that why am I so weak and why do I have to keep going away why why am i not so strong that even being between the non devotees i can still maintain my devotional life so is it well, correct to think like that 
Yeah, you just have to strengthen your 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 spiritual acumen, your your devotional creeper. Mm. To what as Prabhupada says, to whatever degree you may you have made progress in devotional service, to that degree, you're unaffected by material energy. So if you're fifty percent Krishna conscious, you're going to be fifty percent affected by material energy. If you're a hundred percent, there's no effect. It's all deg in degrees. Mm -hmm. mm. Proportion. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you, you might be thinking, well, I wish I was, or you might think that you're more advanced than what you actually are. And therefore, when you see yourself acting in that way, you wonder why. It's because you're still, your bhakti is, is not strong enough or needs to be strengthened. Mm. along with the knowledge that comes with that bhakti mm. which helps us to avoid the traps of material association and again, as, Prabhupada, that as Prabhupada said when you're associating with the materialists you give them your association and not take theirs so here's, an, here's a point are you taking their association or are you giving them your association then that you can decide as you are interacting in that arena and to see, well, am I becoming like them or are they becoming like me? <laughs> hmm. And strengthening will only happen by following the process sincerely with determination. And associating with devotees. And associating, yes. Which is um, the main part of the process. Mm. That is the, that is the uh, you know, when you water a plant, you put the seed in the ground. But if you put the seed in the ground where the ground is not fertile, the seed may not grow. So that fertile ground is association. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, the seed is our is our bhakti, and and when the ground is fertile and the watering process is hearing and chanting, then this then the seed will turn into a nice, beautiful, you know, plant. <laughs> Otherwise, it won't grow, or if it does grow, it'll it'll grow stunted or hardly at all. Thank you, Maharaj. Long way to go. <laughs> no, it's not so long. <laughs> I think there's a ver there's something in the Christian scriptures. Do not throw. Don't do not throw thy seeds upon barren ground, mm -hmm. mm. because nothing will grow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj, for explaining it so nicely, giving examples and clarifying it. Because I was contemplating on this topic for the last couple of weeks, and I was remembering you that I have to ask you for clarifications. Um, and you picked up a topic today which completely related to what I was thinking. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, Matsya Prabhu, you raised your hand previously. You, you want to go ahead with your question? Oh, thank you. Okay. I didn't know if Maharaj wants to finish. Hare Krishna, my humble obeisances, Maharaj. Glory to Srila Prabhupada. I'm extracting, <laughs> I'm extracting um, something from your your today's class. And, it, and also, also I, I could have kind of sensed and, and heard it in your last reply in this Mataji's question. Um, I apologize for joining a little, a little late, um, so I'm not sure, just a couple, obviously like a couple of minutes, I'm, I'm not sure if you mentioned the Bhagavad Gita verse 8-7, Tasmat Sarishu Kalashu, where no. Krishna, where no, Krishna says, 
Krishna says, always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty. Mm -hmm. So I think that is very nice with your class because in the purpose, Srila Prabhupada makes a very emphatic statement. One can continue uh, doing the duties and at the same time think of Krishna by chanting Hare Krishna. Mm. And he starts the purpose by saying, this instruction to Arjuna is very important for all men engaged in material activities. The Lord does not mm -hmm. say that one should give up his prescribed duties or engagement. One can continue them and at the same time think of Krishna by chanting Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. But a little bit earlier, I'm thinking maybe that's, that's, there is more. Because a little bit earlier in uh, verse 30 of the uh, seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna says that he, he says that there are, there are people, there are devotees who are in full consciousness of him. He mentions this Adibhuta, Adidaiva, and Adiyagya. And Srila Prabhupada says, persons acting in Krishna consciousness are never deviated from the path of entirely understanding the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And, and Prabhupada says that in the context of Adibhuta, Adidaiva, and Adiyagya. So like, like um, there, there is more to just approaching the Bhagavata, the Bhagavan um, uh, on the personal level. And then that brings me to, to Chatu Shloki, which says exactly that. Um, when Bra Lord Brahma asked Krishna how what, what should he do in order to remain firmly on the path of devotional service and not to deviate? That was one of Brahma's questions. And, and Krishna says that the person who is searching after the supreme absolute truth, the personality of Godhead, must certainly search for the, for the supreme uh, personality of Godhead um, by incorporating the uh, understanding of, of, of Brahman and Paramatma along with his knowledge or desire to meet the Supreme Lord in person as well. He searched it up to this, he says. Up yeah. to this, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Etavad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the progressive stages as, you, as one goes. And one will understand the absolute truth in all three principles, and then we'll see that within what's in Bhagavan is also in Paramatma. What's in what's in Bhagavan, what's in uh, Brahman is also in Bhagavan, because the Bhagavan is the complete. Searching it up to this means the complete absolute, or Bhagavan himself, the personality of Godhead. The other two are complete, but at the same time missing a certain element. They're complete in themselves, but Brahman realization is complete, but it doesn't have the realization of, of, of active service or the, the same with Paramatma. Mm -hmm. well, these are different levels of realizations and practices of, for, for the jnanis and the yogis, the jnanis are mostly Brahman, the yogis are mostly Paramatma, but the bhaktas include the principles of both the other two and come to the stage of devotional service or active in trying to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Mm -hmm. So that Wanting to please the supreme personality of Godhead is part of the is part of the activities of all of the, of the, the devotees, along with the activity itself. That's Rupa Goswami's definition of pure devotional service. And so we can we can break it down into what are, what are the things that please the Lord? Well, to serve his devotees that pleases the Lord in a favorable way. And to chant the holy names of the Lord, that pleases the devotees, that pleases the Lord also. Following the instructions of the spiritual master very carefully, that pleases the Lord also. 
So when we think of pleasing the Lord, we also think of the, of the activities that are given to us as ways to show how we can please the Lord, ways we, we can offer our devotion in a pleasing way. Yes, in the purport, uh, I'm sorry, have I interrupted you? No, I'm, I finished. <laughs> okay, I thought so. Um, so, and here in the purport to this, uh, to this uh, last verse of Chatur Shloki, uh, Srila Prabhupada says, one who is developed in consciousness certainly makes inquiries into the mystery of the self, of the cosmic situation, and of the problems uh, of life in all spheres and fields. But here the goal of all such inquiries is explained. So up to this, the, uh, the Bhagavan principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Real, realization of the personality of Godhead. There was a time that I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future, sir, any of us cease to be. Krishna told Arjuna in the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, you are eternal, I am eternal. You forget everything, I remember everything. <laughs> we are never separated. Although we appear to be, although you appear to think we are separated. <laughs> And that's another part of Krishna conscious realizations that we're never separated from the Lord. You can't be separated from the Lord. It's not possible. Only your consciousness causes you to think in that way. <laughs> and that's what, that's what material consciousness is. It means separation. Spiritual means no separation. <laughs> yeah, once I've heard, I'm not sure if that's true, but one devotee told me that there is no goodbye in Sanskrit. There's no what? Goodbye in Sanskrit. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice little cliche. <laughs> Yes. No goodbye. Yeah. It's either bye. So when Krishna says, to... yes. So when Krishna says here in this Tasma Sarishu Kala Shaman Anusmara Yudhyacha. Uh, always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out this prescribed yeah. duty. So he means always think of me as Bhagavan or does he also wants to say that we should recognize him in all of the other aspects because there's nothing yeah. but him. Yeah, well he also says that in the... So uh, in any manifestation yeah, in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, which is the verse that follows Tadviri Prati Prate Nampari Pashena Sevaya, the next verse is when you thus learn the truth, you know that all living beings are in me, they're in my they're my parts and parcels are in me and they belong to me. One will not see anything separate from Krishna. We'll see Krishna in, in everything and everything within Krishna. That's the complete understanding. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and that's a matter yes. of realization. It's, it goes beyond the theoretical understanding that comes by reading the knowledge. It actually comes to a realization that you can understand that you are never separated from Krishna and all living beings are his parts and parcels. They have different forms. They're in different categories of life, but all of them have the essential same existence, that they belong to Krishna and they're within Krishna. And Krishna is within them. That's self-realization.
And the way we get to that is through service and hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord will inspire us in, in engaging in service to the Lord, which is meant to be pleasing to the Lord, which removes our material attachments. The glorification of the Lord awakens our, our attraction for the Lord, more so than the service does. The service also awakens attraction, but more, more direct and powerful is the glorification of the Lord. Because the qualities of the Lord are all attractive. That's why he's given the name Krishna, because everything about him is attractive. And you, you understand that when you get into the most intricate aspects of his nature, his personality, how he deals with his devotees, how he deals with the material energy, how he deals with the non-devotees, you, you start to understand Krishna in a way of his his mentality of how he deals in his in a particular a particular way in different situations but you always come to the same conclusion is that whatever he does is beneficial not not just for himself but for everyone then you start understanding when you start understanding krishna then you start just like when you start knowing a person who has good qualities, you naturally become attracted to that person and you want to associate with that person. You may also want to learn from that person. So we, when we start associating with Krishna through hearing and chanting his glories, then we, we become attracted to him and then we want, we want more. It's just natural. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just on a on a personal note, um, I left the. Did you yeah, get it? Ahead. No, no, no. Uh, you, something uh, else. Email is coming. This uh, is but... this is on a per on a personal note. Okay. Um, I left the Oracle of Rama with Abaduda to give to you. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I just thought to send you an email uh, with apologies that I couldn't do it earlier today, um, or even okay. yesterday. If you can but, tell right, me, if, um, if you can tell me how to get it, that would be very helpful. Ah, okay. So you you want it delivered. I want to get my own copy. All right, you want to have your own copy, but um, yes, then uh, I'm returning you. Have mine. I'm returning your <laughs> copy, so because I know you, you also use it regularly. Uh, yeah, no worries. I have one here, so I'll I'll send this one to you, and I'll return the the one I I gave you does not belong to me, but I'll give you my own because it's still unpacked. <laughs> In, uh, <laughs> <It's up> to... <laughs> so I was just yeah. using the other one, but yeah, okay. excellent. Uh, no worries at all. I'll send this one to you by uh, the first messenger. <laughs> Thank you very much. My obeisance is my very interesting. Uh, Lavanya, how are you doing? <laughs> yes, Pirman, as we are um, 17 minutes over our. Um, past hour so if you have time we can take more questions if devotees have a question uh, any more questions um, or comments or realizations devotees Sudha Mataji Purmara Sudha Mataji wants to ask uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Hare Krishna um, uh, Hare Krishna, uh, Tanvat Pranam Maharaj, all glories to, uh, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you Maharaj. Thank you so much Maharaj for the beautiful, beautiful class today. I feel like class is for me, I mean so many striking points. I like this point Maharaj, how this material world is all like good and bad. Mm -hmm. 
how like uh, um, like you know this uh, in the spirituality is like more like a self-contained it's not related to you and how material world is like more related to good and bad right so I got that habit of always like you know okay this is good and this is bad <laughs> So, but today's lecture actually, it made me like you know think about uh, you know the not good and bad. It's all like about you know based on the situation, circumstances. Uh, but everything is good. Nothing is good and nothing is bad. Everything is related to situation. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. I just wanted to say thank you for that. And uh, uh, so, Maharaj, about like. Uh, holy name how it sweeps away uh, like all the desires on the cross level um, and uh, when you actually practice it will help us to see um, like uh, the qualities the negative qualities and new like enterness fearful so i actually have that uh, acknowledging i acknowledge my qualities but it's very difficult for me to actually uh, like uh, i just uh, hold on to it i just uh, think about them but i don't like come out of those things so how should i actually um, help myself uh, in uh, find a spiritual master uh, coming <laughs> out <laughs> yeah yeah you must see my rush thank you <laughs> yeah those so, who find a spiritual master take shelter and uh, aspire and get guidance and instructions and then that's the process for getting out <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. I've been chanting, but um, I always try to actually go back and just uh, see things. And okay, I tried, okay, I did this, I shouldn't have done this. And it's, I keep thinking about those things. Um, um, it's very hard for me to, like, you know, just uh, move on. <laughs> Yeah, so I think but, I think what you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make the material energy nice. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't you you can't it, the story of king nirga in the bhagavatam gives you a whole understanding here is a person who was a very magnanimous very philanthropical very generous king who loved to give charity to the brahmanas and he had a lot so when brahmanas came he would give them many you know, gifts. And a lot of times he would give them cows. So there was a story how one Brahmana came and he gave them, well, that Brahmana, a thousand cows. And then another Brahman came and he gave that Brahman also 1,000 cows. Now, somehow after that happened, the cow from one of the cows from the first Brahmana he gave came out of the herd and went into the herd of the second Brahmin's cows. And then there was a discussion over who owns that cow. Was it the second Brahmana or the first Brahmana? So, so they both went to King Nirga and said, well, this is my cow. No, this is my cow. You gave that cow to me. No, you actually gave that cow to me. So they couldn't settle it amongst themselves. So they became angry and left. Because a Brahmin's property is considered to be worshipable. And so therefore now King Nirga had intentionally given these cows in a beneficial way, but now he was caught up with a problem which he had nothing to do with. And therefore he couldn't settle it. What he tried to do is that first Brahmana, he said, I'll give you another thousand cows. Just forget about that one cow. And that Brahmana said, no, I can't do that. You gave that cow to me, it's my cow. The other one said, no, that cow is my cow. You gave it to me. So it was, the, it was a principle of who actually uh, belong that cow who belongs to even though he was he, both of them were offered more cows but they didn't want that they simply wanted to settle that principle he couldn't do that and so they cursed him and therefore he had to take birth as a lizard in order to receive some punishment for offending the brahmanas 
So this is an example of how material energy works. And this is where you are. You are tr trying to make material energy work nicely. You're never going to be able to do it. <laughs> this is your situation. You want everything to work according to what is beneficial, which is it's not possible. The material energy is constantly changing, constantly moving. What is good at one time is not good at another time. And even what, what is good at one particular time is seen in a different way at another time. Mm. So uh, if you want to get out of that mindset of trying to make the material energy nice, you have to come to the spiritual platform. And there's where you have to take shelter of a spiritual master. And if you make that next step, you'll start to be able to see the difference between what is actually good and what is actually undesirable. And that fits both in the material and in the spiritual. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for does making that make, Does that make sense? Yes, Maharaj, thank you so much for understanding it. Um, uh, yeah, yes, you will see definitely I'll follow your direction. Uh, well, yeah. It says that when, if, if you aspire for a spiritual master mm -hmm. and you pray and, and follow the process, Krishna will send you a spiritual master. Mm. And then your path to devotional service is wide open. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. Every, everything becomes clear and natural. Mm -hmm. If you keep trying to juggle the material energy, you'll be juggling for millions of lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't, you can't juggle it. It doesn't work. It's just the way the material energy is constituted. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's meant for our confusion, our, our, our bewilderment. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, yes, definitely. I realized that. Thank you, Maharaj. That's the materialistic way of material materialistic way of life is. Mm -hmm. Let me arrange things for my happiness. You can't do that. It doesn't work. That's the whole process of material life. They're trying to arrange things to make it work in a certain way. And as soon as they arrange it one way, it goes another way, everything mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. You're, it's simply a, a, def, a process that keeps defeating everyone. That's why nobody's happy. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone's trying to be happy. Everyone's trying to arrange their life to be happy. But nobody's happy because you can't arrange material energy because it works under the control of Krishna, not under our control. We are not the controller of the material energy. Krishna is. Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> I think maybe I'm doing that. Uh, definitely by um, your instructions, I'll definitely accept a spiritual master and I'll follow you. Maharaj. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for listening. Yeah, and simply by that desire, Krishna will show his mercy. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Um, <clears throat> there is one more question by Dheeraj Prabhu on the chat. He is asking, are the spiritual master and the grand spiritual master consciously aware of the prayers of a sincere devotee who prays in love to them? Yes, that's true. That, that is true. To the strength of their sincerity, yes, yeah. So, Guru Maharaj, in this question, like Grand Spiritual Master is Srila Prabhupada? Yes, in that case, yeah. For, uh, for devotees, of, for those initiated by Prabhupada, it's Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. You want an example for that? Yes, Guru Maharaj, please. That's your question? 
No, no, no. Um, I'm just asking further about uh, this uh, regarding Dheeraj Prabhu's question. He didn't ask anything. Oh, okay. It's, it's kind of like a little antidote. It's a story. <clears throat> so um, Prabhupada was in Vrindavan. It was during the cold time. So when it was cold, Prabhupada would sometimes ask for halava <clears throat> for breakfast. So one devotee, his name was ba let's see, Bhag Bhagavati. Bhagavati. I think his name is Bhag Bhagavan Bhagavan Bhaga Bhagavati. I think his name was. And he was cooking for Prabhupada. He was a local devotee, Prajabasi. And somehow some devotee came from America and brought some wheat germ. So, you know, a wheat germ is, it's kind of like this health can add to cereals and has a lot of nutrition in it. So somebody gave him a bottle of wheat germ. So he thought, oh, wow, I'll make Prabhupada wheat germ halava and he'll really like this. So he prepared it. And then he came and he was all excited. Nice hot wheat germ halava. Puts it in front of Prabhupada. Prabhupada looks at it and says, what is this? He said, oh, Prabhupada, this is very nice. This is wheat germ halava. And Prabhupada just waved his hand. He said, take it away. <laughs> Prabhupada didn't want it. He just wanted his traditional halava. So Bhagavati, he was really like devastated. He really wanted to please Srila Prabhupada and the opposite happened. So now he's practically in tears, feeling that he displeased Prabhupada. And he went in front of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in the temple and started to pray. And was apologizing to Bhakti Siddhanta for somehow causing Prabhupada, some difficulty, inconvenience, didn't want, wasn't able to please him. While he was praying, and he was praying in a, what we say, a repentant way, oh, I'm sorry, he hears Prabhupada calling from a distance, hey, Bhagavati, Bhagavati, bring the halava, bring the halava, bring the halava. So now he hears Prabhupada, and he comes, turns around, he brings the halava back and gives it to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada eats it. And he's happy. Nice. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Very nice story. So Srila Prabhupada understood. Yeah, it's true story. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you so much. So uh, Hare Krishna. Okay. We yes. get it. We end here? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for your time and association and uh, such a power packer class today. Um, I have to hear more again and again to understand more deeply, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hey, Krishna. Jai. My basis is to everyone. Bhaja Kalpa Tarubas Cha. Kripa Sindhu Veva Cha. Padita Nam Bhava Ne Bhyo Vaishna Ve Bhyo Namahuna Bhava. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj Thank you